by Teacher Spider and the Golden Thread. And we'll start with a little spider web photo um, as a way to get our imagination running. One year ago today, we locked down into quarantine. I shouldn't say today, it's this month. It depended on what week and where you might be located. We were in Tucson, Arizona, where I'm speaking to you uh, today. One of my practices over the years has involved uh, a walk and then a sit with often a pencil and a sketch pad in hand. I don't much draw pictures. Uh, I haiku. And parenthetically, I benefited enormously from the haiku session of a few weeks ago at Ubaya. I usually do this um, every morning. I try for at least one haiku a day. I call it the one a day, my vitamin awe. During most of the lockdown, this sit and write happened at the break of dawn. More often than not, on our patio under a Palo Verde tree and looking out across a couple of saguaros. About a month ago, I released a digital version of my poetry from this past pandemic year. For my sharing with you today, I went back through that volume and located four haiku that I had written spread across different months, but where I was taking note of spiders travel the night before. While these poems literally were separated by months, placing them side by side in the last few days as if they were written in one sitting. I was surprised at how I came back over and again to a few themes. I guess sometimes it takes a while to notice a conversation that you're having with yourself. The themes seemed very relevant at both a personal level, but also relevant to the landscape of our wider and deeply fragmented body politics these days. I'd like to read these for you one by one as a starting point. So Noah, if we can go to the first one, I've written them so that you can follow each one as I read it. Glistening first light, Listening first light unveiled spiders startling leap, waving in the wind. Glistening first light unveiled spiders startling leap, waving in the wind. Next. Between cactus spikes, the shimmer of silken threads defiantly glisten. Between cactus spikes, the shimmer of silken threads defiantly glisten. Next. Every once in a while, I'll throw in a title to a haiku. Um, in this particular volume, I ended up with a bucket list of 10 things. So this is bucket list eight, touch tenacity. Silk thread stretched from branch to earth, bent by breeze, but grounded on both ends. Silk thread stretched from branch to earth, bent by breeze, but grounded on both ends. And finally, the fourth one. The sun shimmers up and down this golden thread, 
swaying with the wind. The sun shimmers up and down this thin golden thread, swaying with the wind. I think you can go to the next slide, No, I believe it goes back to our spider web that you can observe while I'm talking. Uh, let me offer a couple of notes that I have been noting about the notes that I took on myself, because I think they pose a few questions for our reflection this evening. Wisdom note one from Teacher Spider. Wisdom note one. The silken thread carries light. The silken thread carries light. I apparently really like the verb to glisten. This actually is not new. It keeps coming back in my writing. I once took the time to actually define this verb to my liking. It happened after a rain. And what caught my eye was the impact of the rain and its intriguing quality on everything around it. Now, if you want to go uh, to the next slide, down, maybe two down. I'll go one more down. I'll give you a flavor of what I'm referring to, and then we'll come back to the written piece. This quality of what rain does to everything around it. Droplets fall as individuated little spheres. Once splashed, however, the rain begins to spread and meld and flow. And when mixed with the sudden appearance of the sun, it makes everything shine. Rain glistens to everything. Mediators and bridge builders, we spend a lot of time preparing to listen. To my knowledge, nobody ever taught us how to glisten. So if you go back up, Noah, to the worded slide just ahead of that photo, here's my definition of to glisten. To be present with others in ways that help them shine into their deepest color, purpose, and wisdom. To be present with others in ways that help them shine into their deepest color, purpose, and wisdom. What if we learn to glisten in the midst of conflict? You can go to that photo again of the glistening aspen leaves as I go to wisdom note two. Silk thread knows how to stay grounded while stretching. Silk thread knows how to stay grounded while stretching. Spider teaches us about strength and courage. We rarely get to see these qualities directly, but she leaves us a trace in the landscape. I noticed this as a part of my pandemic bucket list, this wish to touch tenacity. I once wrote this about haiku. The haiku spirit attends to the bejeweled chaos of internal and external soundscapes. The haiku spirit attends, attend. If you want to go to the next slide, Noah, to attend, it's a verb from Latin, ad tendere, to stretch, to stretch the mind until one can listen with a soft heart, to stretch the mind until one can listen with a soft heart. To attend is to stretch and hold fast. To attend requires tenacious tenderness. 
What if we learned how to be tender in our tenacity in the midst of deep disagreement? Wisdom note three. The silken thread does not fear walking in the midst of sharp spikes. What might be most startling about the spider is not her leaps, but her genius in touching and connecting even with the most unlikely of anchor points around her space. Cactus spikes, rough edges of Apollo branch, the nimble constant movement of a flowering bush in the wind, even the odd and otherwise unnoteworthy desert stone, they all are traveled, touched and connected by spider. If we attend closely, we will note this about the spider's home. What holds the center are strong ties to the margins. You can go to the next photo while I repeat this phrase. Here an extraordinary photo where you can see the first threads that were laid that created the initial crossing that reached to the farthest points of the space, sometimes almost invisible. What holds the center are strong ties to the margins. What if we learned not to fear the uncomfortable, not to fear our edges, not to fear the margins that are unknown. In all these small wisdom matters, what seems to matter most may not be what's initially visible, but almost always involves those things that endure in time. It is true of spiders' first threads, the most enduring of the ones a spider will leave are the very first ones laid that touch the furthest spaces apart. Ahead of the web being built, it is the genius of the golden thread. Much has been made of Sun Tzu's advice about waging war. Often cited his view that the sage warrior prepares a golden bridge of retreat for the enemy. A golden bridge of retreat for the enemy. But what of the golden thread? What does it create? Might any of these bits of teacher spider's wisdom speak? into and about our current dilemmas in ways that get beyond the notion of war, of all or nothing victory? And what about our toxic polarization? I have also been taking note of the single most asked question that I have been receiving over the last six to nine months, as we have navigated into the period that led through our elections and into a new administration in this country. The question that I receive over and again, as we respond to the toxic fragmentation in our country, I suppose that mine is not a reliable survey People, from friends to journalists, to local leaders and activists, tend to ask me this question 
by starting with the phrase, well, since you have worked in places that have really dealt with impossible conflict, that are really fraught with conflict. And then comes the question, but it rarely comes first because the question is almost always framed with a lead in statement that suggests both doubt and predetermined impossibility. It is a question being asked, assuming no answer is possible. The framing of the question usually begins with this. If we are this divided, if they are this messed up, if there is no common ground of truth, if trust has been utterly destroyed, where do we start? Where do we start? That's the question I've been getting. Where do we start? I agree, we are divided. We are messed up. We have lost shared truth and trust. Whenever I feel like this, with a sense of being overwhelmed and to some degree of despair, I often return to those friends and colleagues and exemplars who found some way to live into teaching spiders wisdom under similar or worse conditions. Let me share two. Let's take as example, the women of Wajir. Wajir located on the Kenyan side of the Somali-Kenyan border, the borderlands of Somali, mostly populated with sub-clans tracing to Somali heritage, an area of the world that has experienced its fair share of conflict and war. At one point, nearly 30 years ago, a small group of women, about a half a dozen, found a way to turn and face the viciousness of the sub-clan war. I sometimes say that the title of this story is something like how six women stopped a war. Whenever I listen to where they started, whenever I watch a small documentary built on their experience that I've actually given to Noah as a link in the internet that you can follow later if you want to hear this in their own words and see their faces. Whenever I watch a small documentary that captures them speaking, whenever I read their story in the few books that have made it out into the world, I often hear the same starting point. And it's usually in this phrase, we sat together to see what we knew. We sat together to see what we knew. In the midst of a messy conflict, danger at hand, lives being lost, we sat together to see what we knew. We may think that what they found when they sat together was some sort of perfect solution, the best idea to put out. But in fact, they almost always circled around to a first step. The first step was to reach out to who they knew that was just slightly beyond their comfort zone. It started with them as women. Their know what, meaning, you know what the problem is? This we know about it drifted into know-how, what should we be doing? But almost inevitably came back as the first step to their know-who. In their case, they started with one 
simple idea. Find a way to make the local market safe to buy and sell for any woman from any subclan, even when open fighting was underway between the men. That required them to reach beyond the bubble of their immediate circle. That expanded eventually to include elders, religious leaders, youth carrying guns, a disarmament program, business people, a jobs program, local politicians, police, national parliamentarians, and the list goes on. At each step, the same question. What do we know and who do we know? Along the way over the years, the market got safer, guns became fewer, jobs opened up, and they actually changed the name of their movement and organization a number of times to reflect the unexpected growth of the web of their activity. Insights, start local, start small, expand beyond your bubble, listen and grow ideas. We could call this the principle of accessibility. The principle of accessibility. Don't wait for the miracle to come. Reach out to what you can touch now, what is within your reach. Leave a trace. Keep circling to the places that you can touch. Or take the starting point of our friends in Nepal who work on difficult, long lasting and vicious land, water and forest conflicts having come through more than a decade of a civil war. The most vulnerable people in Nepal, especially in the rural areas, all of them need some access to a bit of land need access to a forest, often without any other way to cook but to find some wood to do it with, and access to water, so that these natural resources around them, so needed for life, become the very ingredients of the conflicts and the fights that they have. They approached this effort, which took multiple years in development, nearly five or six until they had a process that seemed to them that they could understand it that worked well. They approached it by forming a spider group, having looked more carefully at what a spider does when it circulates around a space. And they described their process as the mountain path. No, I think that next slide may be a photo of a drawing that they did. It's a I don't know if you'll be able to read all the words, but it's the image that I'd like you to have. If you've been to Nepal, you'll know that there are extraordinary mountain regions. You'll also know that the paths that people use never climb straight up. The paths lead back and forth along the sides of the mountain, such that it's almost like a spiral. Each pass goes by a location where you have just been at some point, but slightly more ground gained. Though, as they know so very, very well, when first making the path, there are many times that the path itself crumbles and must be worked and walked again and again. They don't start with big meetings and convenings. They don't start with big ideas. They start by finding a small group composed of people who as individuals are connected to the groups that are in conflict 
And they call this little formation the spider group. Individuals from each group in the conflict who become friends and as a small group, traveling partners. Almost always walking, walking to remote areas, walking to get to the places where people live that are struggling in the situation of the conflict. It takes time to form this group. It doesn't happen easily or overnight. The spider group does not convene people to their meeting. The spider group goes out and spends time where people live. In the group, the person from each community where they will travel prepares the way for the group's arrival into their home community. They prepare the process by which their community will speak to the group. The group sits and listens. They see the world from the vantage point of that community. We, we might say that this is a form of collective empathy, not so much about walking in the shoes of another person, which is an empathy that we know about interpersonally, but about sitting and seeing the world from the patios, the streets, under the trees, and in the fields where people live. How does the world look from where they live and from what they have lived? The spider group does this over and again. That's the whole notion of the mountain path. It comes back and over again, the walking path around and around. But each time that they come back and through again, revisiting the communities multiple times over and again, each time they bring back something of what they've been hearing and they pick up something of what the community now wants to bubble up and offer them. Each time they pick up and then share a new idea, a nuance, a different understanding. This can feel like you're going in circles. With time, the circling stretches enough to open some shared ideas about how to proceed. Eventually, such an interesting word, eventually, because for them, sometimes this takes years. Eventually, they arrive at a place where a wider community gathering might come together involving all the groups. Sometimes, and I've seen this, more than 500 people in open fields and under trees who have been at conflict for decades. In the past 10 years, they have literally transformed hundreds of long-standing violent conflicts, not using outside mediators, but resourcing the golden thread within their own midst. We might call this the theory of how weird friends change the world. Yes, the theory of how weird friends change the world. If you get a small, improbable set of people to move around a space, ideas and shifts in hearts and imagination might happen. Entomologists, those folks that study insects like spiders and bees and termites, entomologists have been studying this for a while. It started with their question about what they called the coordination paradox, the coordination 
paradox. How do whole collectives, say like termites or bees, how do whole collectives achieve common purpose without centralized control? How do whole collectives achieve common purpose without centralized control? They suggested it may sit in a very odd word that they call stigmergy. It literally has a root that is shared with the word stigma, which you know means to be marked by or to have a mark. We often use that word negatively. But stigmergy literally meant that as they travel, as a termite travels, as example, as an ant travels, they leave, and I'm quoting now the entomologists almost literally, they leave and pick up a scent in the landscape around which others pick up and build. Pick up a trace, leave a trace. What if a thousand conversations around the edges of our lives, just far enough beyond the comfortable bubble? What if a thousand conversations around the edges of our lives helped stitch a web of change? We might call this the theory of the golden thread or the theory of rightness. I sometimes have a running conversation with a few of my colleagues who in the field of mediation have proposed the theory of ripeness, how a mediator should gauge whether a conflict is ripe for intervention. I grew up and was mentored by people who functioned a bit differently than that because you'd only know ripeness in settings of deep conflict in retrospect, you have to continue to cultivate everything that's needed. This might aim more in the direction of the theory of rightness. Cultivate a wider range of conversations through a wider swath of relationships and at the right time with the right people in the right relationship at the right moment, people will land on the right idea. And that is when shift happens. Teacher Spider might put it this way. Travel just a bit beyond your bubble of comfort. Circulate, leave a trace, Pick up a trace, create connections. Don't fear the spiky stuff. Use it to anchor a thread. Plus, the spiky stuff gives you a better idea of the world that you inhabit and the other creatures that might live there and who ultimately affect your life and the life of this planet. Startling leaps are not the starting point. A small step first, just beyond the comfort zone, then the next and the next and the next. Don't stop. Webs do not repair themselves. Golden threads that glisten always shimmer some light. Remember to attend. Stretch your mind just far enough to soften your heart. Stay grounded on both sides. This is tenacious tenderness and tender tenacity.
No, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to go back to the top and read the four haikus and then say a short thank you. Glistening, glistening first light unveiled spiders startling leap waving in the wind. Between cactus spikes, the shimmer of silken threads defiantly glisten. Bucket list eight, touch tenacity. Silk thread stretched from branch to earth, bent by breeze, but grounded on both ends. The sun shimmers up and down this golden thread, swaying with the wind. And maybe leave our spider web photo. And let me just say a word of thank you to all of you gathered today in this very simple way that you mostly do. Thank you. Thank you for your practice. Let's keep practicing on the edge. Oh, John Paul, thank you so much. I, uh, your, your words, what you brought forward really means so much to, to me and to the people who are, are gathered, um, who are engaged in social transformation. So what I'd like us to do is to say thank you to all those friends on YouTube. And then John Paul, I'm gonna invite you to spend just a, a few minutes reflecting uh, with our socially engaged Buddhist community. Um, and uh, we'll uh, open up the, the floor for about 15 minutes of reflection and inquiry, if that's okay with you. And 